Okay, good morning or good evening, depending on where you're coming to us from. Today, we're talking to Lara Bryden, naturopathic doctor and author of the Period Repair Manual, the natural treatment for better hormones and better periods. Everybody needs this book. I just have to say that. Lara runs a busy natural hormone clinic in Sydney, Australia, but she's here with us today from Christchurch, New Zealand. And she's become an online authority on periods and natural strategies for all hormonal imbalances. So hello, Lara, and thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, thank you, Maggie and Shauna. I'm excited. To talk and to it's me. so early in the morning for you. Well, it, did you say it was 8.38? 8, 8, 8.30. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so not, not too bad, but still pretty early. So thank yeah. you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. We're um, really grateful to have you answer our questions because we've had a lot of feedback online with people wanting to dive into more detail about perimenopause and the strategies to work with their symptoms. Absolutely. And there are lots of yeah. some good ones. It's a lot more, it's a lot simpler. It's a lot more possible than women, a lot of women think to use natural treatments for some of the tougher symptoms. Right. And I just want to get this question out of the way because it's just been bugging me. So you're Canadian, but you yes. live in New Zealand, but you practice in Australia. Yes. I moved down to <laughs> Sydney, Australia about, I guess, six, almost exactly 16 years ago to live with my husband and his young daughter. And I lived there. I was, I had practiced in Sydney for 15 years and um, for, I guess, what would it be about 13 or 14 years. And then finally I'd had enough of Sydney. So I said, we need to move over to New Zealand, so I can be near the mountains, which are kind of like the Canadian mountains where I grew up. And but my Sydney clinic is so, you know, busy and just so well established that I just my what I do now is I fly over four times a year. It's a short, direct flight, three-hour flight. And then in between my visits to my my consulting rooms, I do Skype consults with my patients. So it's a way to have some continuity from that practice, but live in a place where I want to be. That's wonderful. Location freedom. Yeah. Wow. So let's, let's start with what is your definition of perimenopause? You know, what are the sort of typical symptoms that are associated with it? Yeah. So it's the at two, anywhere between two to 10 years before the, the periods stop. And it's when the cluster of symptoms, including the periods can start to become less regular or they, they can still stay quite regular and still be in perimenopause. But um, I guess it would be symptoms like heavier periods, um, more difficult periods, sleep disturbance, mood. Those are symptoms that I treat a lot with my patients. Maybe worsened PMS, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it's, it's funny. I, I just started perimenopause two years ago, and I was hit with all of them all at once. So, And I didn't know what was going on. I had no clue. And I denied it for a long time. I know Shauna and I have talked about this because – a lot of our patients, clients just deny it. No, no, I'm not, I'm not in perimenopause. No, there's such sort of a negative connotation around it that they, they don't realize that the symptoms are actually screaming at them saying, well, you're going through this. Well, there's a few reasons I think why we deny it. And the one, I just, I wanted a chance to talk to you guys about this because there's, of course there's a stigma. So menopause is where it's the intersection between kind of in our culture, misogyny, and ageism. So, you know, there's nothing more shameful than being an older woman, according to our society. You know, of course, mm -hmm. I'm trying to re reclaim that, you know, re revitalize that into something different, reframe it, flip the script on that. Um, but it's, yeah, we're still in the generation where, yeah, I think we, we deny because we just, we think, okay, we're not menopausal, you know, that's, that we're not old yet. We're not, that can't be happening. And, it, and I guess the other part of it is the symptoms come on a lot younger than many women might think. We tend to think of, you know, menopause is just something when you're in your 50s or women think 60s, but it's, yeah, it's late 30s into 40s, mm -hmm. 40s, late 40s. That's when, for most women, that's when the worst of the symptoms are. And that's a, an important point. That's something I learned from the endocrinologist, Professor Geraldine Pryor, who helped me with my book. She kind of, she, she phrased it that way. She's, she's like, women need to know that the symptoms they're experiencing now are not going to last. This is not like how menopause is for the rest of your life. This is mm -hmm. a transition that is usually only a few years for most women. And then on the other side of that, the symptoms usually go away. It can be quite tame and easy after that. I think that's important for women to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wish I'd had that when I first started because I yeah. didn't know what's going on and thought it would last forever. <laughs> yeah. um, 
In my practice, um, you know, about 50 to 55% of, of the complaints you were talking about before about, are about PMS, that that changes. Can yeah. you tell us a bit more in your opinion, sort of what causes the PMS in perimenopause and maybe just like a couple of your tips to address that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So from a hormonal perspective, there are two main things happening um, during perimenopause. One, as I, I say in my book, or the way I like to describe it is estrogen goes on a roller coaster ride. So estrogen is always, throughout our reproductive years, it's always going up and down. That's normal. But during our 40s, it starts to shoot, for various reasons, it starts to shoot up higher than ever before. So up to three times higher, three times more estrogen than we ever had before, which is intense. Mm -hmm. And then like a roller coaster, go all the way down, you know, to lower than we've ever had before. And that would happen usually around the time just leading up to our period, that massive drop. And that is not comfortable for the nervous system. Um, Estrogen is a very powerful hormone for the brain, you know, for, um, for mood. So we, most of us will feel that. That can trigger headaches, for example. That's another thing that can happen when estrogen plummets like that. It can trigger, that's where hot flushes, hot, hot flushes come from is that drop. Mm -hmm. So that's, and at the same time that that's happening, we have lost progesterone. It's just a, a sad reality. Progesterone <laughs> is a hormone. It's, you know, the way I phrase it in my book is when, it, when progesterone leaves the scene in our late forties, we can only, all that can mean for us is that we have to be grateful that we ever had it before, you know, when we were younger and just, you know, be thankful we had it. It's, it's going now, you know, the, the body can make, still make a little bit of progesterone from the adrenal glands and the nervous system, but the bulk of it from our ovaries is gone probably. And um, that means that we don't have that progesterone normal, like normally shelters us from that up and down of estrogen. So when we don't have progesterone there to calm us and soothe us and make everything easier, we're going to feel the ups and downs of estrogen more. So that's, you know, that's, that's how I see it. Mm -hmm. And of course there are lots of things we can do about that, which we can, talk about today yes because you you have this natural hormone clinic so what exactly what exactly does that mean a natural hormone clinic oh it just means i treat women primarily for hormonal conditions using natural treatments i do advise women about bioidentical hormones so we can mm -hmm. talk about that today i think any conversation about treatment for perimenopause needs to include um something for a um, conversation about bioidentical and natural hormones yeah, Sean and I have had many conversations yeah. about that one. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have had a lot of questions about heavy flow and flooding. And that seems yeah. to be, for so many women, one of their most disturbing symptoms at perimenopause. I'd love to hear, where do you start? So with the least invasive treatments and nutrition and things like that, and where do you go to? Because women are entertaining pretty extreme interventions at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and I know there's a lot of things in, in the middle. Absolutely. And yeah, heavy periods, they can be quite scary um, during these years. And the, the word they use is flooding, you know, so they can normally, we shouldn't lose more than about 80 milliliters of menstrual fluid during all the you know, three to five days of our period. But during perimenopause, that can, for some women, that can go up to 500 milliliters, just to give a perspective of what some women are dealing with, which mm -hmm. is a lot, which is you know, leads to very low iron, can lead to ending up in the hospital, you know, sometimes can ultimately lead to women sitting in their gynecologist's office and hearing that they're going to have to have surgery or have to have, you know, the hormonal ID or just things that they just never imagined because this might be a woman who's been healthy all her life, always successfully used natural treatments, never thought she'd end up in that situation. Mm -hmm. So it can be quite, become quite real quite fast, quite quickly. And it happens, again, because of this progesterone leaving the scene. So progesterone is normally the hormone that prevents that kind of heavy bleeding, that um, thins and kind of matures the uterine lining so that it sheds in an orderly, <laughs> normal way and doesn't just doesn't flood. So without progesterone, that puts women at risk for that. There could be other reasons why women are having quite heavy periods in their 40s. For example, they might have fibroids or a condition called adenomyosis, which I will mention because it's quite common and a lot of women haven't heard about it and their doctor may not even mention it, you know, even if they've seen it on ultrasound. So it's important mm -hmm. to 
first, I guess the first step would be to get a diagnosis. And chances are, it might be one of those things. It might be thyroid, because underactive thyroid can cause heavy periods as well. So need, all of those need to be addressed. Get your iron checked. Then if the doctor says, okay, it's just hormonal imbalance, that's what they'll say. What they mean is, what they mean by that is pretty much the same as what I've just said, which is what they call unopposed estrogen. So high, very high levels of estrogen, more than you ever had before, which stimulates, thickens the uterine lining, then minus the progesterone, which normally thins the uterine lining. So that's the situation. The doctor's approach, we'll talk about that first, because I'm sure your listeners are nodding, thinking, yes, this is what the, doc mm -hmm. the doctor's approach is either the pill, which is, I will say, is absolutely not appropriate for perimenopause. And the endocrinologist, Professor Pryor, is quite adamant about that. She's like, well, she doesn't like the pill for anyone, really, but, you know, especially women in our 40s, it's not a time to be taking, especially an estrogen pill. But after, after the pill, the doctor might offer the hormonal IUD, called Marina or has different brand names, um, which secretes, uh, releases a synthetic progesterone, not progesterone, but something mm -hmm. called levandestrol, a drug into the uterus. And that, that does work extremely well. Um, it's not without side effects. So it's not my first choice, but I will say at this stage that I think, I still think the Marina IUD is better than a hysterectomy or the removal of the uterus. So if it comes mm -hmm. down to that, then I think, you know, I would go with the, with Marina, but fortunately there are other things we can look at. So, and I, I work through them like in terms of this is the nutritional thing you can do. This is the herbal medicine you can do. This is the bioidentical or natural hormone approach you can do. In truth, I usually offer them kind of all at the same time because it, this is not the kind of symptom where you can say, let's just try it out, you know, try it out <laughs> yeah. for a couple of, because by the time you do that, you know, yeah, they've lost their uterus. So um, depending on the severity, I will move pretty quickly. So the dietary strategy that I find works the best is um, no cow's dairy. And pretty strictly, I just, I, for, and we can talk, you know, as natural clinicians, we can talk about mm -hmm. all the possible reasons why this is, but my observation is that cow's dairy, normal cow's dairy makes periods heavier in almost everyone. And uh, even if someone, they may not have had a problem with dairy before for any specific reason, but I still think when it comes to perimenopause, that might be a time to take a break. Dairy, cow's dairy um, milk products can also be quite bad can worsen, not cause, but can be a problem for the condition adenomyosis that I refer to. So that's step one. And again, saying to them, it won't be forever. It's just until you get through these danger years. It's, next, it's usually going to be you know, a few years if that's happening. Mm -hmm. And then I will say, get your iron up, take iron, whatever it takes, you know, because getting obviously heavy bleeding causes iron deficiency, but iron deficiency makes women more vulnerable to heavy bleeding. For, I think for a few reasons, possibly to do with thyroid hormone and um, different reasons. But then the next thing is, I use the herbal medicine turmeric a lot to lighten periods. So it's, they can just take a turmeric tablet every day or maybe two tablets, depending on the concentration of the medicine. And it works just by um, reducing prostaglandins in the body, just outright reducing the flow, menstrual flow. Mm -hmm. But it needs to be taken every day through the cycle. And then I would start talking to them about a progesterone capsule. So a lot of women are probably familiar with the natural progesterone cream, which is quite soothing, really nice for kind of mood and just easy. You can buy it, well, in the States, you can buy it over the counter. You know, the state of it is in Canada right now. You'd have to probably get it from a description. Yeah. yeah. Um, but for these kinds of flooding, heavy periods that I'm talking about, I do with most of my patients now, I'll go that next step and su suggest that they um, get, that they use um, micronized progesterone capsules or they can get that from a compounding chemist, chemist or the brand name in Australia, it's called Prometrium. I think it's the same in Canada. I've heard that. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a prescription item. It's natural progesterone, which means it's the molecule, the hormone is exactly identical to our own hormone, which is, to our own hormone progesterone, which is, for example, quite different from 
the drug levonorgestrel that I mentioned that's in the hormonal IUD, which is not progesterone. It's similar to progesterone, but it's not progesterone. So there are real advantages to using, if you're going to use a, a, a like a hormone in that category, if you're going mm -hmm. to use something to thin the uterine lining, that there are real advantages to using natural progesterone, be, mainly because it's a lot safer, it doesn't carry a breast cancer risk compared to progesterone drugs, and it's just much nicer receiving. So, you know, I, in my book, I said, some women are going to need Marina IUD. You know, I, I put that in the book. I said, don't be, you know, feel shame if you have to end up using something like that. That sometimes happens. It won't be forever. And that's when Dr. Pryor said to me in one of her, some of her notes that she's like, yeah, it's good, you know, good to mention that they might need Marina, but her experience is that all, you know, she, she said all, I think most, you know, um, perimenopausal women facing heavy periods will respond to the natural progesterone capsules. That it, you know, works so that can well. I ask you, yeah. what is the difference then between a cream and a capsule? I mean, I know the difference, but scientifically, what's, what's the benefit yeah. of one over the other? Well, the capsule, it's different methods of absorption. So the capsule obviously goes through the liver first. It, you know, it, it's going to enter the body in a different way. Um, one thing that's different about a capsule that's potentially a, ben you know, a beneficial thing is that when it goes to the liver, more of, it, more of the progesterone is converted into one of its metabolites called allopregnolone, which is actually quite calming and sedating and soothing and nice. So it's Mm. Uh, another time to use a capsule over a cream, I would say, it would be for sleep disturbance, sleep problems of perimenopause. Okay. But in terms of why, that's a very good question. Why does the capsule give better results for thinning the uterine lining compared to a cream? I actually don't know the kind of mechanism of why, but that seems to be what sh what's showing up in the research. That seems to be clinically what people are finding. It just as a capsule, it has a stronger effect on preventing the heavy periods. So, hmm. I, I, while I'm thinking of it, I want to mention one more thing, which is a little tool for, especially in the interim while women are waiting for these, some of these treatments to work. They, it is possible to use Advil or ibuprofen, which is obviously not a natural treatment, but it's um, just kind of a useful tool for a few months to take that, you know, maybe two or three doses per day, just only during the heavy flow days, so a few days of the month, and it lightens the flow by 50%. Oh, that's quite a lot. Um, which is quite a lot when you're losing 500 milliliters in over a cycle. That can make a, that's a mm -hmm. big difference. So, and I've had that most of, I get that feedback from my patients pretty consistently that that's about what they observe. So my hope is that they don't need that long term. You know, obviously it's mm -hmm. not really good for the stomach lining and it's not ideal to be relying on that every cycle, but at least if it means they can delay having a the hormonal IUD put in, for example, while, while they try the natural treatments, I think it's valuable. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. do you find these treatments work just as well with fibroids and with adenomyosis as well? Yeah, so the progesterone is helpful for the ad adenomyosis. Um, okay, it, in terms of do they work just as well? No, they're not, so if it's just a hormonal issue, mm -hmm. these treatments should work pretty quickly and hopefully within a few months. And, um, it's resolved. If there's an underlying pathology, I guess, you know, which adenomyosis and mm -hmm. fibroids are, it's, it's going to be a longer journey to kind of get that. I think I can, my experience is it can still lighten periods, give some symptom relief, but there's maybe, you know, you're, you're pushing against kind of a, a stronger problem. One thing to say is that fibroids are not usually the cause of heavy bleeding only about 10% of fibroids will actually cause heavy bleeding. So what often happens is a woman's experiencing heavy bleeding, she has an ultrasound, which is a good thing to do, and the doctor says, oh, there are fibroids. Mm -hmm. And then everyone's thinking, oh, they must be causing the heavy bleeding, but chances are they're not. It's only if they're actually located inside the uterus that they mm -hmm. could be the cause of the heavy bleeding. They're, 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 mm -hmm. in a, in a, they're usually more just coincidentally, not coincidentally, but they're there at the same time because they're both common during perimenopause. But the thing about fibroids, if they're not causing the heavy bleeding, if they're not causing discomfort or pushing on the bladder or anything specific, mm -hmm. they don't need to be treated. Like they don't need to be treated or disappear. They, they're going to shrink at menopause anyway. So they can just kind of, you know, stay there. I, I, I'm not overly optimistic about treating 
fibroids with natural treatment. I'd be curious to hear you know, what you guys, results you guys are getting. But what I, the most I'll promise to my, not promise, but you know, the most I'll suggest to my patients and my readers is that some of the natural treatments that I suggest for fibroids will slow their growth and maybe soften them a bit. And it's all just to kind of get to menopause when they're going to shrink by 50% anyway. It's, it's funny because I did have a question on this because I, I myself have suffered from them. And the yeah. only reason I knew that I had was because it was pressing on my bladder. Okay. And then, you know, I, I went through my own treatment. I'm a registered holistic nutritionist. Yeah. So I knew what I was doing yeah. and, and thought that it had gone because after a while I was, wasn't feeling it. Everything was yeah. fine. Went back to the specialist and apparently it had grown. And I was like, how is that possible? Because I don't feel it anymore. But one of the things I was looking through one of my books and Louise Hay says, um, you know, fibroids refer to nursing a hurt from a partner or a blow to the female ego, which I thought was really interesting because as an RHM, we do the body, mind, spirit. So there's, we are talking about an underlying cause. This is potentially something that related to me, but, you know, I can definitely relate to, um, or I'd like to know your perspective on potentially why they start and oh, okay. some women feel them, some women don't. And in my experience, from my personal experience and, and the experience of my clients, whenever they've gone to see a specialist, they always say, okay, we're going to do an ablation or we're going to give you a hysterectomy. Yeah, no. And those are the only two options. I was yeah. given, a, a, I think it was Fibrostil, I think it's called, to stop the bleeding in order to see a surgeon to have it removed. That was my only option. Yeah. Oh, I know. Let me just say I, I didn't take that option. Yeah, fair enough. Well, I just want to respond to what you observed about that you, with your treatment, you then noticed some relief, wasn't pushing as much on your bladder, but they saw on the ultrasound that it had grown. That's actually quite common. So what, the explanation mm-hmm. for that, I believe, well, I've heard other clinicians say this, is that the fibroid will soften with treatment. So I would, you know, with iodine or some of the different treatments that I would use. And yeah. which is good because it means the tissue is quite a hard a fibroid is actually so it's a benign well it's a benign tumor is the wrong word you know it's a benign mm-hmm. growth in yeah. the uterine wall of muscle it's quite like um solid and um when it softens that's a good sign right because it's sort of the fibers are loosening up it's it um but that makes it bigger to soften so that's mm. actually quite common to get that then you get to the objective finding of, oh, it looks bigger, like, but it's just stretched yeah. out. So uh, look, fibroids are so common. Like mm-hmm. I, th- I think I'd be hard pressed to find a perimenopausal woman who doesn't have at least one or two small ones. If, you know, I think I have like a one centimeter one that has been noticed on ultrasound. Like to me, I don't even, I'm just like, that's because I'm in my forties, you know, that's going to happen. It's pretty hard yeah. to not in our modern world to not experience them. Most of the time, they'll be there. You will never know. And it just doesn't really mean any. In terms of why they start, look, I, you know, I think in terms of our, our modern world, I'll just speak to that. I think there's a few reasons going on. I think it's probably pretty clear that the exposure to environmental toxins is a factor mm-hmm. in abnormal growth like that. Um, no one's t- tried to tease that apart in terms of the research. I mean, we're all exposed to them now. So we'd have to go back and ultrasound women in the 1800s and you know, <laughs> like, which we don't <laughs> see the that difference. Oh, um, yeah. Our sound, okay? our sound went off a little bit then. Yeah. Um, does it still sound okay? Yeah. It's better. Yes. It's better now. Yeah. So the other factor is iodine. I mentioned that earlier. I do think so that all any tissue that is estrogen sensitive has a requirement for iodine. This is partly, you know, some, this is somewhat based on some of the research I've seen around breast cancer risk, and but it, it seems to really make sense in terms of uterine tissue as well that estrogen receptors, listeners are probably familiar with that, you know, that the, the, the lock that if, if estrogen is the key, then the receptor is the lock. The estrogen receptors require iodine. So when they're deficient in iodine, estrogen receptors tend to be hyper- overactive. So they, I think you get more, you, more estrogen stimulation in the presence of iodine deficiency. So I feel like that's mm. intuitively, that kind of clinically makes sense to me that 
a lifetime, I'm talking about, you know, decades of maybe suboptimal iodine, I think probably increases the risk of fibro. And just estro exposure to estrogen generally. So we know that this is some interesting research. We know that early use of the pill, estrogen pill, increases the risk of fibroids later. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it would be decades later. They take, you know, 20 years to grow. Mm -hmm. And wow. just, I think just having, you know, maybe just higher than normal estrogen just in those years. So th I guess that's my take on it. Um, again, I'd say dairy might be a factor in there. I just find that dairy is quite stimulating to women's hormonal systems in a, not a good way. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. So the iodine is really interesting to me. How do you um, assess for that or do you treat? Because there's a lot out there in terms of dosing and ranges and sources. I'm curious your take on the iodine piece. Yeah, it's, a con it's probably one of the most controversial topics in natural mm -hmm. medicine. Because on the one hand, doctors are extremely conservative about iodine, don't like to give more than the whatever, mm -hmm. 150 microgram RDA, which is tiny. So that's 150. I'm just going to speak in numbers here to give your listeners an idea. On the other extreme, some natural health practitioners and advocates are suggesting doses of up to 50,000 micrograms per day. That's, that's a big range mm -hmm. there, 150 mm -hmm. and 50,000. So you can see why people get yeah. a little bit confused. And you can also see why there's the perception that iodine can do harm, because I think it can do harm at those big doses, depending on the person. Too much iodine can be quite a problem for the thyroid gland. Um, it can directly suppress thyroid at those high levels, but even at lower levels in the just low thousands, it can worsen autoimmune thyroid disease or Hashimoto's, um, which is when you, the immune system attacks the thyroid. So my first step, and I, I say this in my book, is test for thyroid antibodies. So that is the presence of these antibodies attacking the thyroid, typical of Hashimoto's. If, if they're present, and especially if they're high, then I will tend to be quite conservative with the amount of iodine that I use. I stay down in the hundreds of micrograms rather than thousands of micrograms. That's the main test that I do. I know there's different ways to test for iodine. Obviously, you can do a random urine test. You can do a 24-hour urine test. I just... I'm, I'm not convinced of the accuracy of those tests in terms of our actual iodine status. Like they're really just measuring what we had the day before, you know, what we happened to eat the day before. So I don't know, how does that fit with you, Shauna? Do, is, do you use iodine testing with your patients? No, I rarely do because it's very expensive and I agree, I'm not convinced of the accuracy. So yeah. I don't, I go based on, you know, their thyroid function, their antibodies, fibroids, things like that, and dose conservatively as well. Yeah. Um, I have to say I've been tempted to try the high doses for things like fibrocystic breasts, but I'm not convinced on the safety. <laughs> okay, so, so the interesting you bring up the breasts. So the fibrocystic mm -hmm. breasts, the breast swelling, the breast lumpiness, the breast tenderness, to me, and I say, that, I say this in the book, that's a diagnostic symptom of iodine deficiency. Mm -hmm. I almost use that as a symptom, like as a sign. So... I rely on that. If, if a woman's reporting breasts like that, then I just say to her, your body needs iodine. Your breasts need iodine, but your whole body does. And it's, it's important because it actually does play a role in breast cancer prevention too. So this is, you can, you know, a bit serious about this. It's not just the lumpy breasts. It's, I think the iodine deficiency is putting women at risk of breast cancer. So I take it pretty serious, seriously, especially in someone who maybe has a family history of breast cancer. And then I might, if, if they don't have thyroid antibodies, I, I happily go as high as 3,000, 3,000 or 4,000 micrograms, mm -hmm. 3 or 4 milligrams. And there's a product. Can I mention a specific sure. product on the podcast? Yep. So there's one, um, it's out of the States, but I found a way some of my patients down here in Australia can access it. Hope, um, it's called Violet. It's one of the, it's a tablet. It's a 3,000 microgram tablet with a little bit of selenium. And I just like it because it's of the form. So it's, it's a different, it's not the potassium iodide. It's mm -hmm. a molecular iodine, which what the research shows is more specific. The breasts will take it up and estrogen sensitive tissue will take that iodine up preferentially to the thyroid. So it's a way to kind of get a higher dose to the breasts without putting the thyroid at risk. So 
is yeah one of my kind of newer approaches. For, and I, I would predict that would help with fibroids too, although it's improvement for fibroids is going to be so slow. I don't know if I could even see that or kind of measure that clinically, apart from mm -hmm. what Maggie described in terms of a relief of symptoms. It's funny you should, you should talk about iodine because apparently, I don't know if it's London specifically, London, Ontario, yeah. but we're actually in the goiter belt. Apparently this is the most deficient iodine part of the country. Yeah. I don't know if I don't know if it goes yeah. all the way up to Toronto or oh, it's Ontario as a whole, but London apparently is like right down. Yeah, it's a, that obviously that would apply if you're eating foods that are grown in that area. But mm -hmm. if you're, yeah. And we have a lot of farming land here, which is really yeah. quite, you know, concerning because it's all farmland where I live. Yeah, yeah. And so we're the plants, not, yeah, the plants are not taking up the iodine the way they would in other areas. Yeah, mm -hmm. Australia is the same actually. The whole east coast of Australia where I practice where my clinic is is um yeah quite a, a goiter what they call a goiter belt as well mm -hmm. yeah i'd never heard of it so i went to school i'm like what is that <laughs> yeah. yeah no iodine in the soil okay mm -hmm. so we, i know we've talked about it anyway but I, just be more specific on how does your period change during perimenopause like what are the you know apart from the obvious but the, some of the telltale signs that you think oh okay some something's changing here more than oh it's just one of those things like it's, we're on the big you know the big change here it, it's quite individual I mean it can go there are a few common patterns but it can go lots of different ways so and I guess I'll just the first thing I'll say is it is important to figure out if that's what's happening so just because you're 44 say for example and starting to experience irregular periods it may be men perimenopause it may be thyroid for example, you know, it may, be, it may still even at that age be something like PCOS. Like you need to, it is important mm -hmm. to get kind of a diagnosis and figure out what's actually happening. Perimenopause is kind of a diagnosis of exclusion because there's no blood test for perimenopause. Like it's the, the test called FSH that doctors use for menopause is often, well, depending on what day of the cycle you test, it could be totally normal during perimenopause tends to be quite high if you manage to catch it on like day two or three, but the rest of the cycle, it could be just quite low and normal. So the periods could, there's different ways it could go probably. So the periods could just be quite regular and seemingly normal, but there's a lot of mood or PMS symptoms that were never there before. Sleep disturbance that was never there before. Hot flashes. Or the periods could move in, start to move into this, what we've just spent some time talking about, the really scary, heavy periods. Um, and with, if there's a condition, if the adenomyosis is present, that it'd be pain to maybe new period pain that never had before. Um, then it can go another way. I mean, I'll share my own experience um, at 48 is that my periods, I've, I've maybe quite a good way for it to go. My periods have just be becoming lighter and lighter over the last few years, just, you know, a little bit erratic, like, you know, still kind of in between but my, my, my cycles tend to get shorter. At, with perimenopause, which is quite typical. So that's the other thing that will happen is if, it, if, if they start to become less regular, they'll often shorten. So what used to be maybe a 28 day cycle will kind of start to pull into like a 24 or 21 day cycle. That's because of the higher FSH stimulating the ovarian follicles faster. Mm -hmm. But that might be interspersed with some longer cycles in there. And so they can just become lighter and lighter. That's been my experience. Um, probably the, so, so the less common experience, but can happen. Um, together with, in my experience, a bit of sleep disturbance, especially leading up to the period, insomnia. Um, and there can be spotting. For example, the, when progesterone, the loss of progesterone means that there can be some premenstrual spotting that wasn't there before. Those are sort of the, the main types of period changes. Do, are there other things that you guys are seeing with your patients or clients? That pretty know? much all of those. All of those. <laughs> Definitely, sleep is yeah. a big one, and yeah. you know it, it still blows my mind that that we're not associating not sleeping well with something that is going on in the body that is is out of balance. You know, a lot of yeah. women say that you know, it's just something that they're doing. It'll, it'll all change. It's, you know, I, I'm stressed or I had a bad night or whatever it is. They don't understand that. No, there's a shift going on here. And yep. you know, this is a huge part of your, your journey that you're going on. 
Yeah, it's real. So should we talk about some, sleep, some treatment for sleep, perimenopausal sleep? Oh, sure. I was insomnia <laughs> for about a year, so. Let's do it. Let's just this do This is it. my topic. Um, <laughs> and for something like this, so with the heavy periods, I talked about how I, with my patients, I would normally just kind of offer it all at once. Like, a, you know, just let's just get this happening, get this under control. With sleep, there's a little bit more room for trying things because it's, you know, it's distressing, but it's not going to put you in the hospital. You know, it's, you know sleep is, you, you, you can get through usually. I think the first step is to, as we've said, just know that this is, what's happening like you're not going crazy you know? it's not yeah. something you're necessarily doing wrong you've just been going along in your life and okay now your body's different so you just need to honor that and of course yeah make changes make more time for rest you know pull back on work if work hours if you can you know meditate exercise all those things so for sure um after that my next step is magnesium plus taurine Taurine is an amino acid. I have a formula, a powder, a magnesium taurine powder in Australia that I just rely on. It's my perimenopausal go-to. So they both have, they're both, they both, well, they do lots of things in the body, but one thing they both do is boost GABA. Do you, would your listeners know what GABA is? It's the neurotransmitter. Yeah. One of the main neurotransmitters in the brain, like a dwarf, serotonin is just a small player compared to GABA. GABA is huge. It's our, it's the neurotransmitter that Valium works on. It's our calming, soothing neurotransmitter. And progesterone boosts GABA. So you can imagine the situation when, I just said in our 40s, late 40s, we lose progesterone. So we essentially lose GABA. So we need to try to boost GABA in whatever way we can. Magnesium plus taurine is the simplest, my favorite way. It gives results pretty quickly and it can give a dramatic improvement to sleep. For some women, that's all they need. So it might be that simple. It helps hot, hot flashes. Um, I think because there is also a neurotransmitter component to hot flashes, it's not just the drop in estrogen. So I'll give that, I'll say, let's use this for one, let's say one cycle. You know, I, won't, I won't let you suffer for too long, but let's try this for a few weeks. And I'd say 50% of the time, my patients are then like, oh, I'm, I'm fine now, like I'm good. Um, especially if there's a bit of vitamin B6 in there, because vitamin B6 adds boost GABA as well. So those are some simple, those, magnesium plus B6 is the, um, my favorite treatment for PMS as well. Now, do you have a particular yep. magnesium that you use? Because it's, you know, people go to and fro and, you know, is it bisglycinate? Is it steroid? Is it like, what is your go-to? I generally use bisglycinate because glycine, the amino acid that is part of that formula, also boosts GABA <laughs> and also helps the body to clear estrogen. So it kind of has this, you know, I just feel like the glycine is an added bonus. And plus mm -hmm. the um, glycinate is less likely to cause diarrhea. So it's less laxative than some of the other ones. Of course, if constipation is a symptom, then you might want to look at magnesiums that do move the bowels a bit more mm, interesting so there's so many there's actually many excellent magnesium formulas out there i'm sure you guys have some favorites that you use that are available um in canada so you know we can we can put some brand names mine is is an australian product called mag tor which is magnesium taurate i've heard of that vitamins, and i love it so much mm -hmm. it's what i take <laughs> so um I feel like I'm doing an infomercial for a magnesium. Right now. <laughs> it's really, it's really helpful. Um, also helps with it, magnesium does also help with the production of steroid hormones. So it, in theory, could help with boost progesterone a little bit for those, you know, for those of us who are maybe still ovulating a little bit, making a little bit of progesterone, it can help. So then, that's step one. Then step two, I would look at adaptogen herbs like um, ashwagandha and um, shatavari and. Abir and ginseng, you guys probably have some favorites mm -hmm. that you might use. Those are really nice uh, for like for people in different situations, but especially during perimenopause, they help us. They help to regulate the uh, what's called the adrenal axis, the communication between the brain and the adrenal glands. Which I do want to say, this is very interesting. I just found a paper about this a couple of years ago. The adrenal axis is in part regulated by progesterone. So progesterone has a direct effect on the brain, calming effect on the brain. It also has a stabilizing mm -hmm. effect on the adrenal axis. So again, is one effect of losing progesterone is you just become more reactive to stress. 
that, you know, HPA or adrenal axis just becomes more, more reactive, higher, you know, higher cortisol, things like that. So even more reason to have self-care and take care yeah. of your stress hormones and your adrenals and your day-to-day stress. That's, I've never heard that before. That's very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So we're more yeah. vulnerable for that reason. I, I think of it as kind of a vulnerability in our, mm-hmm. as we've, it's like our adrenal axis is recalibrating. It's going to recalibrate to the new post-menopause situation. And actually the research is that women after menopause in those three or four decades after menopause, the mood, mood is on average quite good. So I, th- I know the body can find its new calibrated state. Um, but yeah, during that transition, we need support. And so self-care is part of that. The adaptogen herbs are really nice to put in place. And they take a few weeks to work, but I'll get those in place. Then the next step would be if, if a woman's done all that and is still suffering, I guess, still having mood or anxiety or sleep, then I would offer progesterone cream as kind of the gentle next step, um, which is just rubbing in a bit of the natural progesterone, but just rubbing it in through the skin. Just take it at bedtime. It's quite soothing. It's quite gentle. I usually use it like not, not every day, but just during the three, um, three weeks before the cycle, two or three weeks before the period. And then depending on how that's going, or if it's a more severe case, I would talk about bringing us back to the progesterone capsules, something like Prometrium or Myconite progesterone. It is so, you take it at bedtime because it is so sedating. It's like a sleeping pill. Like most, I, almost everyone I've spoken to said, okay, that knocked me out. <laughs> I might need to <laughs> take it a little bit every second day or, you know, depending on the, the dose. It's, and mm-hmm. which can be quite a relief of insomnia for the main symptom then. Um, yeah, it's, it's a big one. I don't know about Shauna, but it's a big one in my practice is sleep is, is a really big one, but it, again, it's not, it's not seen as being big. So. It is. Yeah. Of course it can impact work performance and mood and all sorts of things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about nutrition through the forties and fifties and whether you have a different take on that. Um, I've been following your blog for years and you keep bringing up the controversial topic of vegetarian diets versus eating meat. And I'm just curious if you see a different need through the forties and fifties with nutrition or whether that shifts. That's a good question, Sean. I just, um, yeah, I, I guess I, my short answer is I don't see it different. I mean, it's different for every individual. I think, all of us have a different requirement, say, for amount of carbohydrate that we need to calm down our nervous system mm-hmm. in the evening, for example. And I, you know, I think it's arguably that might be higher in our forties, maybe just even a greater need to just honor that and um, have some carbohydrate. We still need the nutrient dense foods, but I would argue that you know, eggs and meat are, um, especially for mood, or if, you know, because their nutrient dense foods provide zinc and vitamins and things that we need for mood. I guess the, the other thing might be that I do think that um, phytoestrogens are helpful during perimenopause. These are what we get from legumes and nuts and seeds. And so that it might be a time to bring a bit more of that into the diet. How does that fit with, do you, do you have an idea of a sort of a different diet for perimenopause? Well, I, I agree that it's individual. I was just curious if yeah. you'd found yeah. a trend. Um, yeah. You know, personally, I find that my body craves a whole lot more animal fat and animal protein than it ever yeah. did, and, and yeah. I find that interesting. Um, more than before. Yeah. Much more than before. And similar to you, my cycles are getting lighter and lighter. So I was just thinking, you know, backbone to hormones, building blocks with cholesterol. But um, I don't see that universally with my patients. It's just been more of a personal observation, but I do eat very intuitively. So it's been interesting. Yeah, there could be something with that. Another thing I want to bring in here um, for some women, it's a topic that hasn't come up yet, but insulin resistance is common in our 40s now mm-hmm. there it's common it, it you know it's going to happen in our 40s just because of age it's more common with older age but also estrogen has a regulating effect on insulin so for some women 
I think is, you know, if you're dropping into states of lower estrogen at times, that's going to impair insulin sensitivity. So if there's a tendency to prediabetes or insulin resistance, then our 40s might be a time to be even more careful with avoiding sugar. That would be where I'm going with this, I think. Um, and that can help to prevent the weight gain that can happen for some women, women around this time. That's usually to do with sort of the shift in insulin balance. And, you know, what's interesting, and just tying that all together, I mean, maybe that's why just to try to combat that or because our insulin sensitivity is changing in our 40s, maybe we do need more of the kind of protein-based foods to counterbalance that. Um, that makes sense too. It's, now that you say it, actually, I'm like, yeah, maybe, I, maybe my appetite for meat is higher than it was, say, five or 10 years ago. It's hard to kind of, it, so many things change, right? Like so many things, mm -hmm. you know, in our, in our ideas about diet and lifestyle change, but. See, see, mine is lower, which is, which is weird because I need that heme iron, but mine's lower. Right. So you'd think it would be more of a, I need that. But, yeah. Well, there's another yeah. factor too in terms of appetite for meat, which is um, the amount of stomach acids. So we can also start to lose stomach acid with age and you know, with um, hormonal issues as well. So that might be something I watch for my patients. Like if they're having, for just for example, um, if they're having any digestive, like bloating symptoms or, and they've noticed their appetite for protein, especially in the morning has gone down, I would, I would tend to interpret that as could be um, that they require some support around boosting stomach acid or taking mm -hmm. a digestive enzyme or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So we wanted to um, to give a little plug for your book right now because okay. um, the uh, the period repair manual is a pretty phenomenal resource if you're wanting to learn more about how your cycle works and all of the ways of sort of deciphering what's going on in terms of um, the hormones and the natural treatments. So I'm going to just show a little picture of it right oh, here. Um, hopefully that shows. <laughs> yes. Um, and we'll put all the links of where you can find that online. Um, we're super grateful for you to join us today, Laura. This has been a great discussion and I always learn more from you. Um, you've been an amazing resource and it's nice to virtually meet finally. <laughs> I was going to say, it's, this is actually, because Sean and I have known each other on social media for a while, but it's like, it's just nice to put, yeah, to have a mm -hmm. conversation sit down and video. I and I, I have the, the first book, which I absolutely love, but I will be getting yeah. the second book. But what I yeah. loved, I don't know if it's in the, the new edition, because I know you, you're saying you have a, a complete new chapter on perimenopause, which yes. is amazing. Um, but one of the things you said is your period is trying to tell you something. Yeah. And this, that's a kind of a good wrap up for the, yeah. this podcast is that it is trying to tell you something. And, you know, either decipher it yourself or, or get a healthcare professional to help you do that because that's where it starts, right? That's where you can see things changing, literally see things changing. Yeah. Yeah, it's giving you important clues about where you're at. Yeah. Say with your, you know, your nervous system, your progesterone, your, all of those things we've talked about. Mm -hmm. Would you say it was, sorry, last question. Yeah, <laughs> Would you say it was <laughs> one of the first things that changes or again, is it individual? The period. Mm -hmm. To me, it was. It seemed to be the first thing that changed. Although that's hindsight. Yep. I'd say yes. I mean, if you're if you're being observant, if, yeah, there could be you know a shifting in the timing, or just a little bit, as we said, heavier or clotting, something different that you hadn't noticed before. Is probably one of the first changes. But again, there are. I do occasionally have women who. You know, I, for example, just to, you know, I've had women who are like, I think I'm going crazy. Like, I'm not sleeping. I'm yelling at my husband. I actually don't know what's going on. And I'll, and I'll say, oh, I think it's perimenopause. They're like, no, my periods are fine. Like, they're totally mm. fine, which maybe they just haven't been being observant, but maybe that, you know, they, they feel like a lot of the symptoms have come on. And um, maybe it's all at once. So they're not noticing yeah. that one thing. Yeah. And yeah. then maybe not observing that it's often the worst of the symptoms might be during the premenstrual time. So that again is an expression of the cycle of anything mm -hmm. that happens during that luteal phase is our period trying to tell us something. Yeah. I love that. That's, that's going to be my <laughs> phrase of the, of the, of the year next year. I think your period is trying to tell you something. Yeah. I love that. So again, thank you so much for being here. It was, it's a great honor and I love your book and well, uh, you. it's amazing having you here. Oh, thank you both. It was a really great conversation. Thank you. Yes, we'll definitely have you on again. And I'll thank see you. you soon, Shauna.
Okay. Thanks again. <laughs> Bye. Bye.